Should physicians seek mental health resources? What will be the everlasting trauma of COVID-19? What are some strategies physicians and other professionals can employ to aid with anxiety and other mental health issues? Learn the answers to these questions and many more on this episode of the Talk To Me Doc podcast. Welcome to the Talk To Me Doc podcast, where it's all about serving the early career physician. Let's talk about the unique issues that face us so we can create a better future for ourselves and those to come. And now your host, Dr. Andrew Tisser. Hey guys, it's Andrew. Welcome back to the Talk To Me Doc podcast. I am so happy to be with you here today. Today we're discussing an important topic, mental health as it relates to our early career, and other physicians. For my returning listeners, thank you again. For my new listeners, you're in for a treat because today, like on every episode, we're bringing you the best guests from all around healthcare and beyond to discuss issues as they pertain to the early career physician. Dr. Melanie Greenberg is a practicing psychologist, author, speaker, and coach with more than 20 years of experience as a clinician, professor, and researcher, a recognized expert on stress management, health, and relationship challenges. She draws on neuroscience, mindfulness, and cognitive behavioral therapy in her work. Melanie is the author of The Stress-Proof Brain. She also writes the Mindful Self-Express blog for Psychology Today. Melanie has delivered talks and workshops to national and international audiences, businesses, nonprofits, and professional organizations. A popular media expert, she has been featured on CNN, USA Today, The Washington Post, The New York Times, Forbes, BBC Radio, and other media outlets. She has also been interviewed on numerous radio shows and podcasts. With more than 50,000 followers, Melanie was named one of the 30 most prominent psychologists to follow on Twitter by the British Psychological Association. Well, without further ado, let's bring Melanie onto the show. Dr. Melanie Greenberg, welcome to the Talk To Me Doc podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Well, I've given the listeners a little bit of a bio, uh, but if you can tell everybody who you are, what you do, and uh, what your role is in healthcare. Sure. So I'm a clinical psychologist but I also have a research and academic background and I also do some life coaching. I um, also teach professionals, continuing education courses to to health professionals. And my specialties are treating stress and trauma and also relationships. And so, you know, this is, this is a good, this is a time where there's just a lot of stress and a lot of trauma, especially for mental, for health professionals. Yeah, and, that's an understatement. <laughs> I want to help. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's been my experience that going through our training, you know, our residency training can be very brutal on a, on our mental health and our, our self of, sense of self-worth. Uh, and then some of the stresses that we are incurring from the system, it's been my experience that physicians in general are hesitant to seek out mental health resources. Um, why do you think that may be? I think that some of it may be the training of physicians, like, you know, you're supposed to be strong and you're supposed to kind of be able to just take a lot, I think, you know, and kind of be make be unemotional, like make very difficult decisions based on logical and factual grounds. So I think that's part of it, you know, to be strong, not maybe there's a stigma around mental health, uh, they're seeing it as a kind of weakness. Hmm. Yeah, I think that that's definitely part of it. But uh, so given everything we've been seeing recently with with COVID-19 and and some of the really extensive trauma that uh, some of our healthcare professionals have been experiencing, uh, what uh, what is your advice to to physicians and and other health professionals in, in order to try and cope with some of that? So my advice is, you know, this is a different time. And the level of trauma is much higher than like what it would normally be. And so at this time, it's particularly important to be mindful of yourself and how you are coping or how you are reacting to, to the stress around you. I mean, it's normal to be stressed and to have some trauma symptoms like maybe intrusive thinking or difficulty or, you know, chronic worry or difficulty sleeping or, um, some of these are normal reactions to just a, vi- a very difficult situation. Um, 
And so it's understanding when it's starting to interfere with your life or your health or well-being. So if you have lots of, you know, if you have stress-related physical symptoms, if it's harder to function, if you're exhausted, tired, if it's hard to think and make decisions, if you, it's affecting your relationships, like you're grumpy or you're withdrawn, those may be some signs of stress to look for. Sure. That's, that's good advice. Do you think that we're going to see like true DSM diagnosable post-traumatic stress disorder from this? I think we are. I don't think in everybody. So if you look at, you know, some of the people, the combat vets and things like that, I think the average rate was about 15% that met the full diagnosis. But um, there's many more people that I think just have post-traumatic stress symptoms without perhaps meeting the full diagnosis. Uh, That I think is probably, it would be a lot more people. And the reason I think could have post-traumatic stress is just see kind of, I, for example, in New York would be an example, you know, like the people being just out of control, more and more and more people and seeing this, this tremendous human suffering that you may not have had the resources to, to fully address, you know, people dying and people dying without their families. And sometimes you might be the only person in the room, but you've also got, you know, eight other patients to go to or something like that. Um, And also the fear for yourself. If you don't have the proper PPE, maybe, you know, can you trust the system to actually take care of your health and protect you? All of those things can contribute. Uh, I also think that if you've had more of a history of trauma, um, you know, other traumas in your life when you were younger, like childhood abuse, that, that could also be a vulnerability factor. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. Are, you know, besides from going to formal therapy, which I think, I think every, honestly, it's my opinion that everyone will benefit from therapy at some point, especially. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little biased though. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but I think especially in the, in the high production, the very productive professional, I think uh, it would, it would benefit everyone. But barring going for formal therapy, are there little things that, that we can do as physicians to uh, try and keep our mental health in mind as, as we are still experiencing some of this significant trauma? Sure. So I think having some kind of a stress management practice or routine that, that you're doing a, on an ongoing basis is very helpful to, to also in a preventive way. So meditation would be an example. Um, and there's, there's, Lots of meditation apps out there. For example, one's called Calm or Heart Space, or you can find lots of resources online, or you do an online course. But meditation, mindfulness meditation, is is a way that you just you know you have thirty minutes a day or so where you just you focusing either just watching your thoughts or watching what's going on in your body, or you know what's around you, what you're seeing and hearing and feeling. Uh, so it teaches you a different way to relate to yourself in that you get more c- kind of connection with your own body and what's going on there and sending breath into the into st- areas that might be very tight or uh, and just awareness of that when things are tightening up. And also it can help you get some perspective and distance on your own thoughts. So, you know, you can, you can just notice the stream of thoughts that's, that's coming through your head as thoughts and not necessarily as like the full reality. And there's a piece that you can, you have, you can, you can feel the chaos, but there's also, you can create a kind of a centering amidst that chaos, a perspective from which to watch all of that. And that can change your brain over time to be more stress tolerant. Is, um, is that some of what you covered in your recent book? Yeah, exactly. The Stress-Proof Brain. Um, so it has a lot on mindfulness. And also, if you'd like, I can talk about some other strategies. Yeah, please. So exercise, you know, and just kind of healthy lifestyle is sort of the obvious one. But it, it also, you know, it, it, it can reduce stress. It's a way of releasing because the thing is that you know, when, when you have these long shifts where you're just going, going, going all the time under considerable stress, sometimes your nervous system can get into a state of like chronic activation. 
and then it's very hard to to actually you know reach recovery it's very hard to get out of that state um but we're actually wired like what what we need to do is to react strongly to something and then recover kind of like the animals you know you run away it's like you run away from a tiger and then you know you find safety and then and then you kind of eat or whatever or go to you know drink your water um, but with humans and, and with the kind of stresses we face, it gets much harder to feel like a complete recovery. And so when you exercise all um, the mindfulness, it can help your nervous system go into more of like, okay, you know, for now it's over. I can just, you know, just physiologically relax and get out of fight or flight. And so that's very helpful too. As is, you know, other things like social support, turning to other people, talking about it. Um, you know, having some kind of a, a hobby or pursuit or something that lifts you up, whether it's doing your art or whether it's, you know, talking to your best friend and laugh, laughter, um, though that can be another kind of strategy, coloring in a stress coloring book, anything like that, that just, you know, creates something positive emotion and lifts you out of the, the negativity. Yeah, that's, that's great. I think, um, I think a lot of it is just trying to come back, you know, you go to work and, and, and you're running all day long and then you get home and you, and you can't use some of the coping mechanisms that we once did. I think there's a lot of loneliness that we're seeing as well. Definitely. And that adds to it. I think the loneliness and the isolation, especially if you live on your own and you know, zoom goes some of the way. It's not, it's not as, as good. But it's it's definitely important if you can stay connected to the people that you love the most, you know, the people that are your main supports, even if they live far away by Zoom or by telephone on a very regular basis, that it does give you a significant piece of it, even if it's not as fun. Sure. No, I, I know I've had a couple of little Zoom parties with my friends and I think I think they're great. It really give, it adds something to your life when it's uh, a lot of gloom and doom out there, you know. Exactly. And then also um, as humans, I think it, it's very comforting to us to, to the sense of an uplifting, the sense of we're in this together. I think we're very social beings. And so just feeling like you, you're not in it alone. You know, there are other people in the same boat and like we all trying our best and we all trying to support each other. There's something about that that's, that's very powerful, I think. I agree. I think, you know, COVID crisis aside, though, um, pre-COVID, and I'm sure it'll be post-COVID, we were seeing really just ab absurd amounts of depression and suicide in the uh, medical trainee population, in the medical student, and then the resident physician level. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think this is oh. this is somewhat part of the training environment, but uh, I don't know if it's being highlighted more now or um, or that things have truly changed. I mean, it's very important that it's highlighted. You know, it might have been more hidden before. Like, you know, people just don't ask for help. Mm. The problem with not asking for help is, you know, it can leak out in other ways, like ruin your relationships or, you know, you can end up with a chronic health problem or even, you know, be, be, become suicidal. Um, so I think it's very important that it's highlighted now. I mean, it seems this, this medical training, you know, the residency, it seems like a very hard life in a way, like, you're, you know, you're, you're just working these ridiculous hours, like your sleep pattern, your biorhythms are disturbed. And I think it's harsh. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's not like a, often you can get, a, get criticism, um, you know, and you're supposed to kind of just suck it up and, and you are new and you are trying to figure things out. I think the kind of people that actually get into medical school can often be quite hard on themselves, you know, like very hard driving, high, high achieving. And those people can be particularly self-critical and, you know, perfectionist. So I think that adds to the stress. Um, as well as I've made, the finances of the whole thing, you know, the, the kind of how expensive it is and how many years it takes to finish. Um, I think those are factors too. And the lack of control over, you know, the, your, your routine or where you, where you get into school, like your day-to-day. Uh, I th and I think also it could interfere with relationships to be that busy and that tired and that stressed. Absolutely. I mean, I, I 
will say this forever that residency was the worst three years of my life for myself and my wife. And um, there were points where I likely was clinically depressed uh, going mm -hmm. through it. But, you know, I, I know when I just for a little story, when I started, uh, my wife and I were going to be two hours uh, apart based on where we were sent for yeah. training. And um, my uh, senior resident at that time before I started said, uh, well, we were, you know, we were dating at the time we were married. He said, well, you might as well break up now. We can't have another unhappy resident here. And that's the wow. kind of, you know, that's the kind of environment you're going into. <laughs> right, right. Like you just, yeah, that doesn't matter. We just, you, you just have to perform kind of thing. Yeah, agreed. No, I think uh, it, it's very, very, very difficult on our, our medical trainees. And despite uh, institutions starting to realize more of it and provide services, I think uh, we could do a lot better. We could do a lot better for them. I think so too. I mean, it's one factor that it's just so selective. So it's like if they choose chose you, they could have had 50 other people, you know, that are very qualified or something. So they like because they chose you, like they want the most out of you. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if that is a factor or not. Yeah, I think that is. I think you're right when it comes to the perfectionism and being hard on yourself. But uh, at the end of the day, people weren't meant to work 100 hours a week. Yeah. Um, it's very know. abnormal. I, I agree <laughs> yes. It and it also keeps people out of the profession. I think you know some people just don't want just don't want to do that or realize that they're not the kind of person who can take that well. Um, you know, but it might keep the person might be very like warm hearted or something or you know insightful or um, you know very smart, but it might keep some people out of the profession. Yeah, and like you said, the finances of it all, you know, mm -hmm. keep, keep a lot of people out of it, but. We're also seeing a lot of, of career dis dissatisfaction and burnout, uh, for lack of a better term, in, um, in our early career physicians as well. Not only our, our older docs uh, who are coming out of residency and just uh, being really, really miserable. Um, now, some of that, I think, is institutional and out of your control. But uh, do you have any strategies on, on how to cope with just, you know, career dissatisfaction and... Uh, and regret for the decisions that you've made as far as your career? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you're very early in your career, the question is whether things are going to, you know, stay the same or whether it's good. It can, you can create something different or find something different. Um, so I'd say, you know, to try to kind of try to look at your options, try to be broad minded about it and realize maybe if you've just come out of the hardest part, that you know maybe it'll get a bit easier now that it, it's not always going to be like a residency so having some hope i think i think that could help um i also think you know it's easy to get down on yourself especially when you're physi physiologically very stressed out like some it can affect the messages from the stress in your body can affect your thinking as well and bias it to the negative so I think that it's being aware of that, like what frame of mind am I actually thinking about this in? Is it just, is it my depressed mood talking right now? And you know, let me think of this again when I'm, when I've had a, you know, a bit more regulated or had my exercise. Um, but you know, if it's genuine issues, then I, I think it, it would be important to just really try to, to, to figure that out, you know, like it's okay to change your mind. Um, and there might be a price you have to pay, but are you willing to pay that price? Or, you know, otherwise it's also a little bit of like, you know, is, is there stuff about this that I can focus on more that actually could be uplifting? Um, I think it's okay to just objectively look at, is, is this for me? But it also, I think you should give it time because you've, you've put so much into it. Sure. And of course, uh, if you need to seek therapy, uh, I think that would be a great idea. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the best thing to do. <laughs> you know, that therapist can help you evaluate, you know, like, I guess, make important decisions in your life based on self-awareness, self-compassion, and awareness of, you know, what are sort of the conscious and unconscious factors affecting you. Agreed. Yeah, I think, and I, I think it took, it took me a couple of years to get over the trauma of residency as well. I mean, I had some some bad jobs that I worked at, but you know, I'm in a good place now, but I think you're, you're so geared up to be in, in that, in that dark place that 
uh, sometimes I agree with you that it just, it does just take time to let some of that trauma fade. Yeah, exactly. And it's sometimes, you know, the further you get in the, in your career, the more control you have over your life. Sure. And in the early days you have very little control. And so it's a kind of a, it's a very long paying your dues kind of a phenomenon, I think. So, I mean, understanding that as well, that, you know, with more, the more qualified you get, the more choices you have. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I'd like to shift the show a little bit uh, just to get to know you as the guest a little bit more. Um, I, we mentioned briefly that you had a book. Uh, what's that called and where can we find it? Sure. So my book is called The Stress Proof Brain. And it's a way to manage stress using mindfulness and neuroplasticity. What neuroplasticity means is, is, re- is doing um, practices over and over and over again. In, over time that changes your brain pathways. Often our brains can be wired into negative pathways. And if we, we practice mindfulness or we practice you know, challenging the negative thinking, uh, you know, the, the exercise and health, as well as um, you know, finding hope and finding uh, grit. And, and there's a lot of different strategies that can re- over time rewire your brain. And so I think it's, it, it brings in a lot of different tools for managing stress that are based on research. Great. I'll put the link to the book in the show notes for the listeners. Um, it's on Amazon. Yeah, there's a link to, you know, on Amazon. Or if you okay. go to my website, d- drmelaniegreenbook.com, you'll find that as well. Perfect. And uh, what do you like to do for fun? <laughs> I'm also pretty busy. That's funny. I mean, I like to go hiking. Um, and I live in a beautiful part of the world. I'm in California, uh, Northern California. So I'm very lucky. Uh, so I like to go hiking and, and take pictures, um, of the, you know, not professional pictures, just with my iPhone of the, the ocean or the wildflowers or of the trees. And, um, that puts, that is very relaxing for me. Oh, that sounds great. Although some of those pictures on the iPhones these days come out pretty nice. Exactly. Say. Yeah, exactly. And I don't want to worry about the technical. You know, yeah. I just want to do the point and click. And we That's want great. To click, get on with my walk. So I also be- enjoy like seeing friends when, and, um, and having, you know, I used to enjoy restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all did. <laughs> do, um, what do besides your own book? Do you have a, a book recommendation for the listeners? Maybe something you you've been reading lately, or or an all time favorite? Sure. Um, so I, you know, I'm writing a book myself, but it's it will be a while till it's out. But it's called the Trauma Proof Brain, and it's sort of the same ideas, um, but applied to trauma. Um, in terms of a book you could find now. Um, there's one called the Anxiety Toolkit by Alice Boys, and it's got it's also very like practical research based cognitive behavioral tools for managing anxiety and negative thinking. Um, so that's the one that comes to mind. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that I can think of right this minute. Um, you know, various books on mindfulness, like by John Kabat Zinn. Um, he's, he was the kind of the original mindfulness person, um, the mindful way through depression, if you're feeling depressed. Uh, so those would be some, some examples. Sure. Thank you. Self-compassion. There's another book, Self-Compassion by Kristen Neff, that can help you with, with, actual, with practices, you know, to learn a different way to relate to yourself. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. I'll put all those, uh, all those titles in the show notes for people. And, um, so to wrap up, if, if you could give uh, the early career physician, just a single piece of advice, you've already given us so much advice in this, in this show, but just one piece of advice for those starting off in their career, uh, what would that be? So the, I think what I, I would say, like, just show up and keep going. Like half of life is showing up. Mm. And like, and you will get through it and don't over, you know, don't overthink it. Don't let the negative thinking bias your decisions too much. Okay. I like it. And, uh, you already listed your website, so that's where they can find you and your book and, uh, and your work. So I just want to thank you again for coming on the show and speaking to this, to our listeners about such important topics. Thank you for the opportunity.
<laughs> Absolutely. Well, we'll be in touch. Thanks, Melanie. Take care. What a powerful show with Dr. Melanie Greenberg. I know I will be taking a lot of her advice to heart. She feels that some of the hesitancy to seek mental health resources comes from physicians training and seeing it as a weakness. COVID-19 brings with it higher levels of trauma than usual, and some feelings are normal, but she advises reaching out when it starts to interfere with your life and well-being. Dr. Greenberg discusses stress relief tactics such as meditation, mindfulness practice, exercise, social support, even over Zoom, hobbies, stress coloring books, etc. Melanie feels depression and suicidality have always been present in our trainees, but are just not highlighted well. She stresses that for burnt out early career physicians, it is okay to change your mind and look for something that makes you happy. She also stresses over time, the trauma of residency fades, which may increase job satisfaction. Well, that's all we got for today, folks. Thank you so much for listening to the Talk To Me Doc podcast. The one thing I'd like you to do after listening is send this show to another early career physician that you know. Hopefully, it can help as many people as we can reach. Additionally, if you would please leave me an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, it really helps get the word out there. Feel free to reach out to me at any time, andrew at talktomedocpod.com or at my website, andrewtisserdo.com. All right, well, until next time, guys, keep talking.